was hoping to do is to introduce the afternoon keynote speaker. Someone who I think many of you actually know and maybe remember from the days that he was working for Axis Communications, because already at that time, Patrick was involved in, uh, in Software Center. But then he realized that the grass was greener elsewhere. Is that a fair way of putting it, Patrick? <laughs> maybe after nine years, yeah. Uh, maybe you did, <laughs> right? And what happened is that uh, Patrick joined a uh, smaller company called Advenica, who, to be honest, I had actually not heard of. I'm not Swedish, I do not live in this country, but, um, uh, but the more I learn about Advenica, the more impressed I am with what the company is all about. They provide basically very high grade, think NATO, uh, highest national security levels kind of uh, cybersecurity solutions. Patrick will tell a little bit more about that in his keynote, uh, which I think is a really interesting topic because cybersecurity is becoming increasingly important for all of our industries. I mean, we used to have a very simple cybersecurity strategy, which was we do not connect our products to the internet, problem solved. Right? I mean, that's how we did it. Cars were updated in the workshop, uh, and many other products basically had no internet connection. That's, of course, not feasible anymore. So cybersecurity has become increasingly important, which is what Advenica, personified by Patrick, is actually bringing to Software Center, an enormous amount of knowledge in the cybersecurity space. On the other hand, the way Patrick describes it, is that the development practices within Advenica are maybe not entirely up to the 21st century yet. We're getting there. We're getting there, but still. And what Advenica is looking for is what are the no newest, most modern development practices that they can borrow and learn from the other software center companies. So I'm really excited to have Advenica as a new partner in the software center. And I'm even more excited about the presentation that Patrick is going to give, because it will not just be about what is Advenica all about, but it will be very much also about um, what is the state of the art in cybersecurity, what are the regulatory constraints, and what do you need to be aware of for any of you in the room, not just people that work for NATO or for other parts of uh, the defense industry. And with that, unless you want me to say anything else, Patrick. Well, I love hearing your voice, Johan. But wow, okay. But then I, what I'll do is I'll basically open up for, uh, for uh, your keynote. And with that, please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Patrick to this. Thank uh, you. Scene. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity. Um, Advenica joined Software Center on March this year, and as Jan pointed out, I've uh, been here before, uh, several years ago, uh, in the early days of Axis and Software Center's collaboration. I was quite involved. Um, so. Uh, Jonas asked me to give a short, very brief overview of what Advenica is and what we do, roughly. That will go very fast. And talk a bit more about the cybersecurity landscape. And not from the perspective of how do you make a side, uh, side channel attack, uh, what is ChatGPT's role in the cybersecurity spectrum, uh, or what happened to SolarWinds 20 years ago. But, but maybe zoom out a bit and, and give a bit of a broader context for, for the cybersecurity issues that we're all facing. Okay, so that's my attempt. I have 400 slides and 30 minutes. So let's see how this goes. So, Advenica's mission, basically, is to help countries and organizations protect their most valuable digital information. More specifically, we're quite good at data in motion. Uh, 
the products and solutions we offer uh, enable a secure data exchange and the ability to physically isolate networks while still connecting information in a safe way. And our encryption solutions enable a secure data exchange at the highest possible level. Our ComSec products, Signalskydd in Swedish, uh, have the highest national classifications you can get in Sweden and in the EU and are, uh, are approved to handle the most secret information Sweden has and send it over the internet. We uh, were founded in uh, 1993 in Lund, actually, like one of the other software center companies here. Uh, we've been on the stock market since 2014. Like that company, we also entered the stock market to avoid bankruptcy. Uh, our offices, we have our HQ in Malmo, and we also have offices in Stockholm, Helsinki, and uh, Vienna. So, the world of building these types of high assurance products, these are products that are required by law to keep information secret for at least 70 years, in some certain cases, twice that length, so 140 years, um, against technology that does not exist yet, and we need to prove it will to the military intelligence auditors that work with us through every step of building these products. So we need to prove mathematically that this technology will fulfill this Swedish legislation. Uh, we are facing opponents who have near endless resources and who are actively attacking these products constantly. Um, and if they manage to find an exploit, nobody will ever tell us. So our customers are mainly in the national security segment, defense, governments, uh, some critical infrastructure companies, power distribution, power manufacturing, etc. But we're also seeing an increasing interest from enterprise customers in protecting their most valuable data or digital assets. So that was Advenica. I will spare you any more details. So, so if we zoom out a bit and look more at the, the threat landscape we're facing now, uh, as you all are aware of, you read the papers, organized crime are targeting all aspects of society for profit. There are ransom attacks everywhere. We read about it daily. Um, the time it takes to weaponize a new exploit has changed from months to days or hours. Jesus Christ, what happened to this slide? Well, it's, it's changed due to the advances of AI, basically. So what, what typically took very highly skilled individuals a very, very long time is now done very quickly with the proper tools. So we expect to see a very large increase in the amount of CVEs and also the amount of attackers who are actually actively trying to exploit uh, the vulnerabilities because these tools will be commonplace. Sorry. Critical uh, vulnerability exploit thingy. Some of those words might be incorrect, but you get the idea, yeah? <clears throat> so basically, what happens when a, a, um, an exploit is identified live in the field, you have a zero-day attack, you publish a CVE to let the world know. And then all companies affected by this exploit, let's say that there is a potential exploit in the Linux kernel, and every software delivering company in the world will need to patch that exploit. And then there is another part, which is not organized crime. But you all remember, I think, what happened on this date. The Russian aggression on Ukraine put threat levels in Europe through the roof. All of a sudden, what people worried about wasn't just if you could get oat milk in your coffee at Starbucks, but people started asking different questions. I live in a small village outside Lund, and we have a local Facebook group there, like you do in small villages. 
where people sell their kids old toys and clothes and things. And there started popping up new questions. Where is the nearest shelter? Why doesn't anybody know where the nearest shelter is? Why is the nearest shelter closed? What do you mean it needs renovating? What do you mean it fits 50 people? The distance from Malmo, where I work, to the Ukrainian border is about 800 kilometers. And as a reference, the distance between Malmo and Stockholm is 600 kilometers. We have a war in Europe with a massive aggressor, basically on the north outskirts of Stockholm. We need, to, I think, in our protected lives in a democracy that we all live, pick up the kids from daycare, uh, take them to football practice, eat tacos on Thursdays. I think we need to understand what this means to the threat levels against our society. And the Swedish security police and the Signals Intelligence Authority tells us that hybrid warfare and nation-state cyber attacks are the new normal. And, and the attacks are targeting not only the government, not only the defense, they are targeting everything in an effort to learn, but also in an effort to destabilize our society. Private targets are a prime attack vector, and this has escalated. Um, Russian foreign intelligence are a lot more aggressive and are taking a lot more risks than they used to, due to the need to acquire technology for the war in Ukraine. They cannot acquire technology in their normal ways anymore because they're being sanctioned. So they, t they target high-tech companies. This is uh, an official statement from the Swedish military in intelligence. Uh, it's in Swedish, I'm sorry. Uh, they communicate only in that language. <laughs> um, but cyber, the cyber threat and the risk of cyber attacks are the greatest threats at the moment. To be able to meet this threat, all organizations and companies need to look at their security protection. This is not just about functions that are critical to our society. The Swedish security police says that Sweden's independence and democracy are values that might seem like we can take them for granted, but they are being challenged every day, and all of us must help in building a resilience towards these attacks. The EU estimates that the total cost of nation-state cyber attacks and organized crime are 5.5 trillion euros per year. This was two years ago, so I'm sure there are a lot more now. Uh, and they're reacting with uh, new legislation. That's how you react if you are a if you are the EU or a, or a nation. I'm not sure if some of you might have heard of this already, NIS 2. It's a uh, European directive which has been approved and will be passed into national law by all member states at the latest on October the, of 2024. It replaces the NIS directive which was adopted in 2018. And basically what it does, it regulates how certain critical sectors need to act, or more bluntly put, pull their heads out of their fucking asses and, and start working with cybersecurity. It puts um, uh, mandatory requirements on risk assessments, consequence analysis, incident reporting, physical security, cybersecurity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you have 24 hours. If, if you have a problem, you have 24 hours to report it to a European authority. What's new in uh, Nice 2, it seems like uh, that part has disappeared from this slide as well. I blame the train Wi-Fi because I sent it from the train to Malin. So. <laughs> but... The, the, another thing that's new here, apart from expanding the amount of industries that are affected from just critical infrastructure to a whole bunch more, this is now a GDPR-like uh, legislation. 
There are sanctions here. You can be sanctioned, I think, 10 million euros or 2% of your worldwide turnover, whichever is highest, if you fail to comply with, with these regulations. And you will be audited. Oh, holy shit. Okay. Um, another, um, another EU directive, which is not yet been passed, but is being discussed. It's being pushed right now by the Swedish presidency, who's trying to put it into law. Uh, I don't think they will succeed before the 1st of July when the presidency passes. But let's say the Cyber Resilience Act is one or two years out, basically. Maybe two years before we feel the full force of it. Where NIST 2 puts regulations on certain sectors, the Cyber Resilience Act puts regulations on all products containing software. This is also a GDPR-like regulation. Here, the maximum fine is 15 million euros, or 2.5% two, two of the total worldwide annual turnover. And you also have 24 hours to report to European authority if you're affected by any vulnerability. So if we, if we combine this with the fact that weaponization is at an increasing speed of CVEs, of vulnerabilities, exploits, and the amount of attackers are also increasing dramat dramatically, people start, will need to start to get their shit together. Uh, it will have two phases, CRA. Uh, within 12 months of adapting a regulation, all your products, old and new, that contain software, you will need to be able to manage vulnerabilities, you will need to be able to report exploitable vulnerabilities, and you will need to be able to inform your customers. And the reporting is within 24 hours. In a later stage, for new and updated products, you need to show your supply chain security, how you work with security by design, and other things. So, the easiest way to sort of, on a high abstractive level, describe the CRA is basically, you all know about uh, this CE marking, right? Any electrical product being sold in the EU needs to show it's been vetted and validated that it will not kill people, right? And the responsibility for this being done is the manufacturer of the product is responsible, but also the company who is selling it is also responsible. And you can be sanctioned if you're selling unsafe products. So the easiest way to describe CRA, I think, is that it will be a CE marking for any product sold in the EU or distributed in the EU or manufactured in the EU that contains software. There will be some exemptions. Some uh, regulatory heavy industries looks like they will be exempt because with all these regulations, the EU believes that they will be able to control it anyway. Military is one. Looks like medical will be one, and maybe automotive as well. So if Volvo or here somewhere, you're, you're safe. Uh, anyone who puts a product with digital elements on the EU market. Yeah, and also it looks like software as a service solutions, which has no local software components, where everything is spinning in the cloud, might also be exempt. So, this is some of the responsibilities. Vulnerability tracking for all releases, security patches free of charge. You need to disclose your vulnerabilities quickly to customers. You have 24 hours to report if you are affected by an exploit that is published. And you will need to, at all times, provide and publish in a way where everyone can find and download your software bill of materials for your product. And this it's not just uh, what, the, what it looks like right now. This is what it has looked like at every point in time when you might have been affected by an exploit. And it includes the software in your tool chain. 
And then you have a further five years where you need to keep records of all documentation, events, releases. That's probably easier for everyone because 10 years is the standard length you need to keep things like financial records, etc. So, you are responsible and you will not be able to hide. You are responsible for everything, including the open source software running on your systems. Transparency is mandatory. You cannot say, well, we don't want to talk about this. We don't want to disclose this. Uh, this is a business secret. Not anymore. And the only way you can survive this is by adopting what Software Center has been preaching for 11 years. Is it 11 years? Yeah? You need to be faster. If you're slow, you will die. So for anybody who is actually very fast, this is a great competitive advantage. But automation will be key. You will not be able to handle this manually. You will need to be continue, you will need to be able to do continuous everything or you will not be fast enough. Threat modeling and implementation of countermeasures needs to be part of your everyday work in your DevOps cycle. You need to have automated CV scanning of your code base and of your tool chain. You need to make sure you have a cybersecurity incident response team set up and running that can meet whenever there is a new CV published and that can ascertain if you are affected or not and that it's mandated to take action. Because you will need a communication strategy in your company which is based on full transparency on your vulnerabilities. You will need your incident response team to be able to be mandated to take a decision on the press releases you will publish on your web page on the exploits that you are affected by. And the software bill of materials you have will be one of your most important assets. See, Axis has started publishing a software bill of materials. They're very good, right on time. <laughs> yeah. And this is not just an R&D issue either. Of course, this affects R&D because it's software, but R&D cannot handle this by themselves. You will need high-level management buy-in. You will basically need someone on the executive management team to be in charge of this, because these sanctions, these, these new laws that the EU are passing, they are targeting management. They are targeting C-level individuals. So you will not be able to do this just as an R&D organization. So, that was a brief overview. If you want a deeper dive, please visit our webpage. We have articles, blog posts, white papers, all sorts of things. Uh, looks very stylish, too. Or get in touch. Send me an email if you want. We can. We're all friends in Software Center, and we help each other out. So if you want to sit down and have a longer talk or a workshop, get in touch, and we will, we will set something up. Thank you. Let's start by giving an applause. <laughs> awesome job. I was hoping that someone could run around with a microphone. Not my microphone. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> there is one question in the back. Very good. Yeah, uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I'm curious, who does this affect exactly? Does it affect like any company in the European Union? Uh, or does it only affect companies to a certain size or something like that? Uh, the Cyber Resilience Act, which is targeting products, will affect every company who distributes or sells uh, products within the EU. So, With so software, like even right? if you're a, so even if you're like a very small startup, you have to have all this sort of infrastructure yes. in place. Yes. W uh, the way the legislation looks now, it's it's still a draft, uh, and there uh, it hasn't been passed yet. There might be exemptions. There is an issue on open source, for example, because this includes open source as a producer of software products. And uh, when they read the first draft, the open source community said, well, we will need to withdraw from the EU. <laughs> you cannot use open source in the EU anymore. 
And nobody wants that, so there will be a new draft. And there is a new draft, which the Swedish presidency and the EU has pushed. But it has not been translated to French yet, so the French can't read it, so nothing is happening right now. But, but maybe after summer, something. French, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's not go there. Other questions? Sorry, I couldn't resist. The Germans thought that this was especially funny, so <laughs> I don't know why. So, sorry, Horst, I couldn't resist. So yes, about SBOM, uh, you mm. brought up, you know, open source, there are multiple competing standards like SPDX, Cyclone DX, and so on. This yeah. fragmentation yeah. on these things, like how best to approach these things and make sure like there is one standard to rule them all. It's not the way I am trying to say, but to Im influence those communities yeah. coming up with these things, like yeah. just consuming them will not take you far. Yeah, yeah. That will be an issue, definitely. I mean, uh, right now the, the, the text doesn't point at a specific format or a specific standard. But of course, I mean, what, what, this, what this law, the, the draft for this law says right now is of course totally impossible. Every single company in the European Union that creates a product which has software, which is everything that is not a toaster, will within 24 hours report all known vulnerabilities to one European authority, which will be the most massive DDoS attack in the history of the European Union. And everyone will use their own format as well. So there needs to be a standardization, there needs to be a consolidation. And, and I think that what's happening is that the lawmaker has identified that the threat level is so high and companies are not approaching this in the correct way. They're not taking the responsibility they need to. They're not investing it. This is expensive, and there's no benefit of it. So they're forcing investments. But maybe in the one to two years it takes before it's pushed through Parliament until it's applicable, there will need to be a standardization uh, or, and consolidation effort. Absolutely, definitely, yes. Uh, yeah, what about a exploitability of vulnerabilities? Is that also included that, that it actually has to be exploitable? Like an uh, unconnected toaster that has software in it has, you know, it doesn't matter if it has vulnerabilities, right? Um, I'm not sure how that's formulated right now, but uh, it, it, at, least it's, at least it's stated that it needs to be... The, the, the connectivity, I'm not sure how they're looking at connectivity, but uh, in order for it to be applicable to you, it must be exploitable. It must be exploitable in your product. You can have, there can be instances, for example, where there is an exploit in the code base you use in your product, but you use it in such a way that it's not accessible for anyone, and then it's not exploitable, so then you're not affected. Yeah. Other questions, because I have uh, several, so if you allow me, I'm going to jump in and then you can think of, of some more questions, because I think that this is a super important topic for all of us to be aware of. Patrick, when I visited Advenica and we had this wonderful event with your uh, primary stakeholders, mm -hmm. because I have not seen as many people in uniform as I've seen during that event, I must admit. <laughs> um, one of the things that you stressed and others stressed is that in the kind of business that you guys are in, whether you have been hacked, mm. you will never know. No. But there must be ways in which you are addressing that particular question, I suppose. I mean, the point here is that if you have a foreign national uh, uh, organization that gains access to your systems, they will actually do everything they can to make sure that you are not aware of the fact that they have been or can get into your system. Does that make sense? Yeah? Whereas normally, you know, people make a lot of noise. Oh, I managed to break in. Now they're doing everything to stay quiet. I mean, yes. That's one of the key things, I think, because you, you don't know if you're succeeding or not, right? No. So how do, you, how, how do you go about that? You just try harder and you're more paranoid uh, than anyone else? Is I, that the answer? I can't comment on how we work, I'm afraid. No. How, how would you advise the people in the room to uh, respond to that then? How's that? Um, I think when you move into that sort of space, if you are building applications for national security, mm -hmm. you will be made aware of that because there will be people popping up who want to meet you. 
uh, and, and before you are at that stage, I think that if a person will find an exploit in your product, they will publish it. Because that's how you gain credibility, right? You have these researchers who spend a lot of time finding and identifying new exploits, zero-day vulnerabilities, and they want to publish because they want the credibility. Right. So, so before you move into the national security space, you will be made aware of uh, if there are any exploits in your product. Right. Yeah. Because, I mean, the point is that it used to be it's either military or it's civilian. Yeah. But it's now much more of a grayscale, right? I mean, it's, many it's a lot more, more of a grayscale. I mean, a lot of the private companies we help in, for example, critical infrastructure, we're helping them with national security use cases. Yes. Because it's a matter of national security if we have electricity or not. Yes. And, I mean, if I'm looking at uh, companies like Ericsson, I mean, they provide what as I suppose to, is national security level. I mean, connectivity and communication Most is likely. an important part, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least. Good. Are there other questions that people have? I can keep going, but I'd love to have uh, more of the audience, uh, audience engagement. No? Because then the next question... Oh, there is a Mr. Meding. Good to see you, my friend. You've been so quiet today. I was wondering where you were. I'm working on it, so give me a year <laughs> more and then I will be back full time. So anyway, given what you have said, is there any plan on going on how to address this? Because you, yes, of course, the, the companies can just put aside a lot of money, but the profits has to rise at the same time, or otherwise business will go out of business. So is the EU addressing that, or is that no. leaving it no. to us? No, they're not addressing it at all. They are, they are for basically forcing companies to act by uh, threatening them to find them 2.5% of their worldwide revenue yearly. So, so wouldn't that make companies worldwide hesitant to, to, <laughs> to sell things here? Right. In, in, uh, Could be, yes. That could be an effect, yes. But there are similar legislation in other places as well. And I'm not, we're mainly working in the EU, so I don't have the detailed knowledge of uh, American legislation, for example. But there are several presidential directives with, which are addressing basically the same thing as, as NIS2 and, and uh, CRA does. So, so it's brewing uh, not just in the EU, but. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Just a comment, not a question, I thought, because. Uh recently worked in the wind industry where we are, well, they, they are actually heavily involved in this already. And, and there, it is also coming from the customers that uh, they should fulfill uh, these requirements because uh, wind turbines is critical infrastructure and the uh, requirements is both coming from this too and from uh, the US uh, legislation also. So it's not just the government which is coming, it's also the customers. It's actually coming with the same requirements nowadays, at least in, our, in, in that industry. So it's coming from many different uh, areas now. Mm. Yeah. I have one closing question, and then we let Sylvia in, if she doesn't disappear. I hope she, no, she's just getting a microphone. <laughs> um, the traditional response that most companies and individuals have when being faced with these kind of threats, like 2.5% of your revenue or 15 million, whichever is higher, yeah. is to slow everything down to not change everything, because if I don't change, if I don't make changes, I know my set of my 1998 Linux distribution quite well, yeah. Yeah, and I don't have to change anything. Whereas what we've been pushing for in Software Center is to actually change faster. I mean, many companies are moving into, or exploring how to do we get into DevOps, yeah. but this is one of the things that actually threatens them and makes them want to move slower and avoid uh, getting into that space. And you were explicit about, no, 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 you have to move faster, you have to be more automated, you have to Absolutely. iterate faster. Can you explain a little bit on your thinking there? Because the natural human behavior is to slow down. Even yeah. in your industry, I think you yeah. see people slowing down. Yeah. I think there are two different things. First of all, I mean, the requirements on speed that is put in this, into this legislation means you have to be faster. Uh, there, there is no alternative. And to be faster, you have to do two things which are key in digitalization anyway. You have to automate more, and you have to work cross-functionally. You cannot work in silos, because you will be too slow. Handovers will kill you. So, so that's one item. And, and the, other, the other way I'm coming from is, if you look at GDPR, 
mm. the, how that was rolled out, which was basically the same thing. Mm. You do not have control over this information. Get it together or give us all your money, was basically the, the, the uh, message from, from the EU. And that started with wild panic, and then hundreds of thousands of lawyers increased, putting a zero at the end of their hourly bill rate. And then when everything slowed down, most companies realized that, hang on, I think it's a pretty good idea that we have control over this information. Mm -hmm. And it's not such a big deal, really. There are some certain things we need to do, and that's it. And I think this will be the same thing. Right. But we have to get going. And it, we have to get going. And, and those of us who are fast, who work uh, cross-functionally, yeah. and who are highly automated, we have a great advantage over everybody else. So let's kill the competition. I like the sound of that, as long as it's non-European competition. <laughs> let's not go there. Uh, with that, I would like to thank Patrick once again for coming out and giving thank a, you. a keynote. Yep. Let's give him an applause. Thank you. Thank you very much.